Okay, we're getting ready here now. We're live and we're gonna head into this presentation by Dr. Kelsey Leonard. And so I'd like to begin first by briefly introducing myself. Um, how me talk about me? Diane wa chiang kapelo wa kia machi api si chang ru la kota tama kochi kia manta. My name is Joaquin Lapointe. I am Bert Thai Lakota from the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. And today we're joined by Dr. Kelsey Leonard. I'm gonna read a brief introduction for her. Um, throughout the years, she's been uh, attending the Minikiwakan Indigenous Water Decade, our summit, and supporting us in our work as we provided input on uh, the global water crisis to the United Nations and other areas. So we're really grateful for her time today and to be uh, learning more from her and hearing from her on uh, important areas such as uh, indigenous water sustainability and human rights. So Dr. Kelly, Kelsey Leonard is a water scientist, legal scholar, policy expert, writer, and enrolled citizen of the Shinnecock Nation. Her work focuses on indigenous water justice and its climatic, territorial, and governance underpinnings for our shared sustainable future. Dr. Leonard represents the Shinnecock Nation on the Mid-Atlantic Committee on the ocean, which is charged with protecting America's ocean ecosystems and coastlines. She also serves as a member of the Great Lakes Water Quality Board of the International Joint Commission. Dr. Kelsey has been instrumental in safeguarding the interest of indigenous nations for environmental planning and builds indigenous science and knowledge into new solutions for sustainable water and ocean governance. So we have a number of questions prepared, but before we get into those and into your key presentation, I want to hand this over to you to introduce yourself and again, Wopla Kanka for your time and your words that you'll be sharing here today. Absolutely, thank you. Um, it's so great to be here. Uh, you know, it's been really difficult with COVID-19 and the pandemic where I always looked forward to being able to come together for our um, mini Kiwaka uh, gathering. Mm -hmm. and so yeah. not having that has been a little bit of, of definitely a, a sad spot of, of the pandemic mm -hmm. in addition to everything else. But it's nice to be able to come together virtually. So I'm really happy to be here with you. I uh, appreciate the introduction. Um, as you mentioned, I'm from the Shinnecock Nation. So we're a coastal Algonquin tribal nation located on the east end of what is currently known as Long Island, New York. And uh, right now I'm zooming in from Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek territory in southwestern Ontario. So really happy to be here with you all uh, in these virtual times. Thank you, thank you. And I uh, just wanna ask a quick question here and uh, it's something on uh, from your bio, from your West website, um, KelseyLander.com. And it says that you represent the Shinnecock Indian Nation on the Mid-Atlantic Committee on the Ocean, which is charged with protecting America's ocean ecosystems and coastlines. Can you share a little bit about what that work involves? It's very interesting. Uh, thank you uh, so much for that question. Um, it really is about stewarding, I should take a step back and even before getting into what the Mid-Atlantic Committee on the Ocean is, I should say why I fundamentally am interested in protecting our ocean. Well, one, I think everybody should be interested in protecting our ocean because it's part of our planet. Um, and if we want to have a healthy planet, um, we need to have healthy ocean. But a step back, being a Shinnecock woman in our language, Shinnecock means people of the shore, people of the stony shore. And so I think our ancestors knew something, you know, they, in, in naming us that, they, they charged us with the responsibility to care for that shore, to care for the coast, to care for our ocean. Um, so the work that I do to the Mid-Atlantic Committee on the Ocean is really a part of that, that charge and a part of, of that responsibility that our ancestors have handed down to us as Shinnecock people. And so what does the Mid-Atlantic Committee on the Ocean do? Well, it really is about creating a forum where different entities that have um, jurisdiction, authority, interest in protecting the ocean come together to share ideas and to innovate and to learn from one another. Because one of the biggest challenges to environmental governance, to ocean governance today, is that we operate in silos. Federal agencies don't talk to state agencies, don't talk to tribes, and then we wind up with conflict or we just wind up with a whole mess. Um, and so the Mid-Atlantic Committee on the Ocean is really a, a forum through which all these entities come together to create new solutions for our shared sustainable future. Um, and it's been a real joy to be a part of it for the past uh, 10 years or so. 
Uh, sounds like some amazing work there. I'm interested to learn more on it and about, also about ocean water governance. So that'll be a part of my journey here. Um, and so also I want to ask, what is indigenous water justice and governance? I know that's a big question and so much more to it, but um, I think those are really powerful terms and just a brief understanding of it will help go a long way for participants and even myself. So thank you. Yeah, well, I will definitely um, later on unpack a bit of what we mean by indigenous water justice, but there definitely are four, are three principles normally when we think about the conceptualization of justice. Um, and they center around uh, fairness, um, participation, as well as equity. But I add a fourth principle, and, and we'll discuss this in more detail later, that I think is very indicative of how we get from just justice conceptualizations in the Western world to indigenous conceptualizations of justice. And that fourth pillar or principle is about relationality. It's about our responsibility to our more than human kin, to the, to the natural world. And, and sometimes we forget that. We become really human-centric, um, anthropocentric, and we, we forget that we have responsibility to other life on this planet, to the, you know, to other uh, life out there in, in, in the universe outside of ourselves being, you know, really, really infant um, in, in the scope of, of the universe. So that's a bit of what I'll say for Indigenous water justice. I also want to add the caveat that we're not a monolith. So within indigeneity, there are so many different Indigenous nations, governments, societies. So Indigenous water justice and then also Indigenous water governance is going to look different in different Indigenous localities. So that is important, but we can say that there are some you know, maybe general principles that, that are embedded within these concepts. When we talk about indigenous water governance, we're talking about the way we make decisions about water, I like to say for water, as indigenous peoples in fulfilling those responsibilities for being caretakers and stewards of the water. Well, uh... So before we get into your presentation, I really appreciate those uh, responses and enlightened many things for me. And uh, I just want to share a little bit about Miniki Wakan. So Miniki Wakan means water is sacred. That's often referred to as a Lakota protocol, an original law that the Ocheti Shakui Seven Council Fires of the Plains areas uh, refers to and helps to guide that relationship that Lakota people have uh, with water riverways and other uh, sources of water that you know give life and so the theme of this year's Niki Wakan as we go throughout the year hosting several sessions with indigenous water advocates champions and others who are working for a better and sustainable future for water is addressing the western world an indigenous call to higher consciousness and so this session's title is indigenous waters human rights and sustainability which allows us to talk broadly on many of these areas uh, from the perspective and knowledge of Dr. Kelsey Leonard. And, you know, this is an important session uh, for Miniki Wakan uh, as we go further into this um, exploration of, of this topic. So with that, I want to get ready and uh, give you time, Kelsey, to get your slides prepared. And uh, I'll share a little bit more as you're pulling those slides up. Um, and uh, yep, they're already up. So with that, we're ready to go. And uh, I'm gonna take myself off video. Wonderful. Well, thanks again for the opening conversation and laying out the foundation of our conversation for, for today. Um, for folks that are joining via Facebook, um, watching live stream, maybe watching the recording later on, if you have future questions and you wanna reach out for potential opportunities for collaboration or to answer those questions, uh, you can reach me. Um, on Twitter, that's where I'm sort of mostly more active, um, and uh, my handle is at Kelsey T. Leonard. So what we're going to talk about today, um, I already sort of did my introduction, but I love to show this slide of my homeland um, and, and home waters because I think sometimes uh, it's good as Indigenous people from all over the world to be able to orient ourselves to um, where we're from and, and to our different communities, because I'm sure many of you tuning in today may never have uh, been to uh, what's currently known as New York or Long Island um, and, and may not be aware of my nation and, and our territory, but we are located on the east end of Long Island as pictured here in the map. As I mentioned earlier, we're a coastal tribal nation. So um, the portion uh, pictured here in purple, you can see is right 
uh, across from us is the Atlantic Ocean. So we've got areas where freshwater meets saltwater, um, ocean spaces, bays, estuaries, um, and we traditionally for millennia uh, been ob uh, obviously because of our proximity to water, uh, fishers and uh, bay people and also um, harvesters of different forms of shellfish. And one of those types of shellfish are quahog, um, which you can see here. And that is what we harvest and carve um, wampum that you may know of. Um, and I always like to share that with folks too about the connection between ocean and maybe what we might term freshwater systems because a lot of what we know today in terms of the first transboundary water treaties uh, in what we currently know as North America, many of us refer to as Turtle Island, were constituted by, with wampum, uh, either through belts or strings, and they formed these first treaties, and they formed the first way in which we understand water governance and more broadly water justice in, in indigenous territories of Turtle Island. And so I think it's, it is really good for folks to know that our relationship to water is formed and constituted in many ways by our connection to the sea and our connection to um, these ancient mollusk relatives. So for those that are tuning in, you um, may really enjoy some of the things I share with you this evening. And I wanted to highlight a, a TED talk that I gave. I think it was also circulated. I think this photo may have been used for today's, uh, to highlight today's presentation. Uh, but I encourage you to go and watch the TED talk if you haven't had a chance. It really does talk about a new emerging area of law that I'm going to share with you today called Earth Law. Um, and what is really important about this new emerging area of law called Earth Law is I think it has really distinct foundational connections to our Indigenous legal systems. And maybe in a lot of ways, as Indigenous peoples and nations, we've been practicing Earth Law for millennia. Um, and so there's a lot that the Western world and Western legal systems can learn from us and how we try to care for the natural world, to care for our more than human relations. And so um, I sort of captured that in, the, in this TED talk and it's a nice uh, way to sort of share what you're learning today and what we'll be talking about today with friends um, after, afterwards if you're not able to even share the link to this. So in this TED talk, we, you know, I, I talk about how as indigenous nations and peoples, we often struggle with communicating to non-Indigenous governments, representatives about our relationship to water. And maybe it's not that we struggle with communicating that, it's we struggle with being heard. Um, as I mentioned earlier with my role in the Mid-Atlantic Committee on the Ocean, my role in different um, regional, international environmental boards like the Great Lakes Water Quality Board, um, there are these spaces where non-Indigenous and Indigenous peoples come together to try to find, you know, innovative collaborative pathways forward to manage and care for shared resources and, and shared relations, but we often aren't using the right words, we're not, we're not translating well, we're not communicating well. And I found this to be really, really prevalent in the context of water um, and how we ask questions about water in the way that we take care of it. Uh, and so often in these more westernized, dominated water governance regimes, I was seeing sort of Western practitioners ask a question about what is water? What is the water that we need to manage? What is the water that is being impacted? What is the water that I need to be able to uh, divert for agriculture or what have you. But that didn't resonate with many indigenous leaders that were coming to the table to say, we need to care for the water um, and, and we need to treat water as a living relation um, as we have in our indigenous communities for thousands of years. And so it came down to our failure of communication was really around maybe we aren't asking the right questions. Maybe some of the big environmental crises and problems that we're seeing in our world today are actually driven by failures of communication in, and those failures of communication are based in asking the wrong questions. And so instead of saying, what is water? How different would our outlook be on making decisions for water if we treated it as a who instead of a what? And this really is the distinction between 
our approach of water management versus our responsibility to water. And I, I had um, a really, there's a wonderful uh, indigenous elder named Henry Lickers. He's actually an international joint commission commissioner, uh, indigenous commissioner, Haudenosaunee commissioner, um, who advises Canada and the United States on how to, um, how to ensure the protection of transboundary waters between the United States and Canada. And he, he said recently, he said, you know, when, when sort of Western non-Indigenous folks say management, it feels very clinical, very distanced. It feels very much about how can we manage the water for human benefit? How can we manage the water so that it is for our personal use? Rather than if we're talking about caretaking, if we're talking about responsibility, that's, that's a completely different approach to how you interact with water, to the types of decisions you make for water. Um, and, and he also brought up this idea that in saying and treating water as a who rather than a what, we start to have a more familial relationship with water. That's where we talk about water as kin. And when you do that, you take on a whole different responsibility as a human being in terms of asking questions about water stewardship in the context of management, where you're just asking, oh, what do I need for the water to be a benefit to me versus what is the water need? What is my responsibility to the water to ensure that its needs are met for its ability to exist and thrive and flourish and be healthy and have well-being and wellness? And so we're not really there yet. We don't overall globally ask the who is water question. We're still kind of really centered on the previous question of what is water? How can we manage it? You know, how can we make sure that it's centered for an, the consumption and benefit of humans? But slowly we're starting to see a shift. And I think a lot of that shift to who is water is led by indigenous leaders like Henry Lickers, like so many other indigenous um, leaders, including Mini uh, and all of the indigenous youth who have been a part of this mobilization and movement effort to really recognize uh, indigenous water relations and our understandings of our connection to water. And so you may be asking yourself, okay, I, 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 can, I can see where that is important. I can see how communication failure can lead to conflict, but you still may be struggling to see why this is a priority or should be a priority. Well, it should be a priority, unfortunately. We had the IPCC report come out uh, this week on, on Monday, I believe, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and they've termed us that we are in code red, um, which is really serious. It, it really is serious in, in the sense of our, our, our climate crisis. I put it in quotes because I feel like sometimes, you know, saying code red, I think that works for the Western world. I, I think maybe Indigenous peoples are like, we've already been in code red for hundreds of years. And there's a wonderful scholar named Zoe Todd and, and Heather Davis who wrote a piece um, that actually talks about this. And they talk about um, our current geologic age, which is termed the Anthropocene. Um, and as noted here on the slide, the Anthropocene is really seen as being this ge uh, geological age where it's a period during which our human activity has been the most dominant influ influence on our climate and the environment. And Zoe Todd and Heather Davis in, in this article that they wrote really date the Anthropocene to the start of colonization of the New World and the transatlantic slave trade. So to around that sort of 1492 marker. And if we think about how much our world has shifted in the past 400, 500 years because of that type of consumerism, greed, manipulation, colonization, genocide, slavery, it starts to really click as to why we need really transformative practices in our legal systems and our governance systems if we're going to tackle this big crisis that we have before us. And if we're going to tackle uh, you know, this, this, this era of, of code red that, that we're now in, and, and I think there's a lot that the Western world, that non-Indigenous folks can learn from us as Indigenous peoples, because, you know, as others have said, we've been existing in this code red for 
hundreds of years since the onset of colonization. We have been seeing our communities change so rapidly and have been living on the front lines of climate change for centuries um, and, and decades in, in really frequent rapid changes um, within our climate and environment that we so dearly rely upon um, for our cultural, ceremonial, spiritual, political existence. So that's why I'm a big champion for trying to change systems, to, to be leaders. And, and we all can have an impact in our individual pockets of the world. And hopefully together, they collectively add up to the change that we need to see. And why do I think we should focus on, on water? There's so many different aspects of our climatic existence, right? There's water, there's land, there's air, there's soil. Um, there, all of it comes together and, and, and is important to be working to protect. And we all have our, our gifts that we bring onto this planet. And so for some of you, you're going to be soil protectors. Um, for me, as, as I mentioned, it, it is to be a, a water protector, but I think there's other reasons for us to also maybe start somewhere, and maybe that somewhere should be with water. And that's because uh, the World Wildlife Fund came out with their Living Planet Report last year, and they said that uh, we have lost about two-thirds of the world's biodiversity since the 1970s, and the most dramatic decline of that biodiversity has been in freshwater ecosystems. And so when we think about restoration of water, when we think about healing water, when we think about caring for water, we're really also contributing to building back that biodiversity, to rehabilitating ecosystems so that they can thrive and so that we can really see all of the wonderful species that we depend upon and that the planet depends upon be safe and healthy and, and, and maybe in some instances be able to bounce back um, where, where they are facing really dire circumstances. So it brings us to a question of who is justice for? We started out our conversation talking about water governance and indigenous water justice. And when we think about justice, we have to ask who is it for? Is it only for humans or is it something more? And I think from an indigenous perspective, it is for something more. We should have a more holistic approach to justice where justice is not something solely for the benefit of human beings, but for the benefit of all peoples and nations, inclusive of our more than human relations, um, you know, inclusive of fish, inclusive of water, um, really allowing for those more than human relations, that natural kin, to also be able to have the realization of justice across the four pillars that we mentioned earlier of fairness, equity, participation, as well as relationality. And so what does this look like in, in practice? Well, it means that we need to be advancing and advocating in different spaces for justice um, that fits it broadly into some of these categories. But again, we have to be we have to be adaptive. We have to make things a cultural match for local context. Um, but if we are to think more general and, and more broad, one area would also be to to work for indigenous water justice in the context of recognition justice, which says that we ask you know, are there, is there a certain group or is there a certain community that's bearing a disproportionate burden of water injustices? We've asked that question so many times this year in the context of COVID-19 and the pandemic. We know that our, our native communities, our indigenous communities have faced disproportionate impacts of the virus and of the pandemic due to lack of access to adequate water supply. Um, when, you know, early on in the pandemic, when health guidelines are saying, you know, one of the greatest preventative measures against contraction of the virus is to wash your hands, but you don't have adequate water supply uh, to be able to wash your hands, then that does set you back. It, it, it makes it more difficult for you um, to be able to meet those health guidelines. And it also makes you more susceptible than other populations in the world. Um, and we saw that unfortunately through, through loss of life. And so that has to be something in the future that we work to combat. And we can really try and advance notions of water justice through recognitional justice and through ensuring that we make sure that there aren't disproportionate burdens of injustice being born and, and, and being um, laid upon certain communities rather than over others. We also have to ask questions around procedural justice. So 
what opportunities exist for meaningful participation in water decision making. This kind of gets to the water governance lens. Are indigenous peoples actually able and afforded the self-determination to make decisions about the water in our territories that we have a relationship to? Um, if we're not, then we're seeing a form of procedural injustice occur. We also need to ask questions around distributive justice, which I'll ask are harm and benefits fairly distributed? You know, when we think about water, if, you know, if water is being extracted out of, a, you know, out of a territory or area so that it can be consumed uh, for, a bottling for a bottled water company when folks in that region don't have access to clean water from their tap, that is a distributive injustice. That means that certain folks and communities are benefiting from access to that water while others are disproportionately suffering. And, and that is something that we have to work against or to try to combat um, so that we can ensure that there are shared benefits um, and those benefits are distributed fairly. Additionally, the last area is around restorative justice. I think this relates to that principle of relationality. This often doesn't come up in, in mainstream water governance and water justice conversations. But it should, and I think it's starting to more. But again, that's this. This is sort of that arm of transformation that we need given our current climate crisis. And what this would look like is really asking questions around our ecosystems and more than human relations accounted for in our restoration efforts, in our work to protect water. If they're not, why not? And and really trying to make sure that we are co consistently ensuring that our work. And our work towards achieving justice is not centered on human benefits and needs, is not anthropocentric, but actually allows for, for balance and maybe even in some instances is, is more ecocentric than anthropocentric. So the hope is that in doing this, we can kind of combat the status quo. Um, and what is the status quo of, of water governance and, and water management right now? Well, it really is, it, it's a categorized and, and characterized as a process where our laws right now actually legalize the destruction of nature. Um, it, they've made it so that we see this two thirds of biodiversity loss in the past uh, 50 years. Um, we see that we've lost about two thirds of the longest uh, rivers no longer flow freely either through dam proliferation or other forms of extractive industry. We also have seen a loss of about half of the coral reefs in the past 30 years. So our status quo business as usual isn't really working for us. And it's important then to think about what types of mechanisms are needed for this transformative change to disrupt the status quo. And we started to see it with movements, um, water protection movements like those um, that occurred uh, at Standing Rock against the Dakota Access Pipeline. We're seeing it right now with indigenous um, leaders and communities on the front lines fighting against the proliferation of pipelines um, like Line 3 and Line 5. So, you know, we really are still seeing indigenous bodies put on the front lines of the climate crisis in defense of land and water. Uh, and un unfortunately, we are likely going to see more of that. Um, but the hope is that maybe we can find a path forward that reduces conflict and allows for there to be more transformation and acceptance of processes moving forward. So when we think about what that could look like, what are some of these mechanisms that could allow for this transformation? As I mentioned earlier, there's this new emerging area of law called Earth Law. It's often sometimes called ecocentric law. Um, and it is about protecting, restoring, and stabilizing the functional interdependence of Earth's life and the life support systems of our planet. And more so, Earth law also encompasses maybe some other mechanisms within the law that you may be more familiar with through recent conversations, like rights of nature, uh, things around the prevention of ecocide, animal rights, rights of future generations, particularly pertinent in the context of the climate crisis our indigenous law and, and the legal systems we've um, developed over thousands of years, human environmental rights, um, sometimes atmospheric trust litigation, as well as guardianship principles. We have a lot of wonderful indigenous guardian programs around the, the world and, and many of those programs have also contributed 
to the maintenance of biodiversity um, within Indigenous territories. We mentioned earlier that we've seen about two thirds of biodiversity loss globally um, in, in recent decades. But of the biodiversity that remains on our planet, 80% of that biodiversity is actually concentrated on lands, territories, and waters maintained by Indigenous people. So I feel like it's important to share that because with every negative statistic, I think there's also hopeful statistics. And, and we have a lot of knowledge and understanding as Indigenous peoples that we can share with the broader world. So when we look at rights of nature, if we take one of those examples of earth law and see how it might be putting, how it might be coming into fruition through practice, I wanted to sort of show you uh, the example of rights of nature. So within the context of rights of nature, it tries to correct an already flawed legal system. Um, and what it, it does so by saying that nature has fundamental rights to exist, thrive, and be free from pollution. And its goal is to restore nature to health and it supports human rights, indigenous rights, as well as other types of rights. And usually it does this by giving nature a voice. So that can be through guardianship bodies, political representation. Um, and sometimes we also have to think about rights of nature within our decision making. How do we make sure, again, those questions of justice, those principles of justice, of fairness, of equity, of participation, of relationality are captured in the decision making that we have in relation to nature. And rights of nature does that in a lot of ways in the framework that it establishes. So if we go down even a little bit further from the tree, so we start up top, we've got earth law, we come down to rights of nature, let's come down a little bit further and look at it in the context of water, because that's what we're talking about today. And you may have seen this um, happening globally, there have been recognitions of the legal personality of water, um, also called legal personhood for water. We had a really great case of this happen in the context of the Magpie River, um, in uh, the river that runs through um, a portion of Canada, also known as Quebec, um, but it was recognized by the Innu uh, First Nation in collaboration with a local municipality um, and some of our dear colleagues um, who have been a part of Minikulkan were actually instrumental in leading that effort. But they're not alone. There are other Indigenous peoples like the Yurok tribe in California who also recognize the rights of the Klamath River. Um, and so what does that look like in practice? So they're going to be different with each local context, but for example, um, generally what we can say is that it means that in recognizing the personality of water, there are legal enforcement mechanisms that are set up, there are co-governance arrangements oftentimes created so that Indigenous peoples, uh, non-Indigenous peoples, the water itself have a role in decision making. Um, and it also sometimes means that there is the establishment of water guardians. We get the question a lot, who gets to speak for the water? Well, that should be locally based and context specific, and it really should be for communities to determine who has the best interest of water and can have that, that good mind to be able to be that voice for the water. And it's gonna look different in different parts of the world, but generally there are water guardians that are created. It's a more holistic approach to really ask what does the water need? And hopefully, in allowing for these recognitions of legal personality of water, we start to dismantle the exclusive um, idea of water ownership or water property rights that has evolved globally in Western legal systems. Again, um, in the past few hundred years, a, a lot of which can be connected to colonization and, uh, and settler colonialism. And so I wanted you to know too that, you know, I wanted to trace the, the process of earth law, rights of nature, legal personality for water, but to let you know that this is a part of a global movement. There have been constitutional amendments around the world, court decisions, local ordinances, and indigenous law, like with Yurok tribe and the Indian First Nation that have recognized in different forms and fashion, um, rights of nature or different aspects of, of earth law, from Mexico to the United States, to Colombia, to New Zealand, to Bolivia, uh, all different parts of the world. And in many instances, these efforts have been led by indigenous peoples and nations. So in the context of indigenous folks um, and indigenous governments, if we are looking to try and advance this transition to allow for there to be more opportunities for the realization of indigenous water justice, I wanted to share with you a few ways that indigenous nations are already um, operationalizing earth law, putting it into practice. 
So that includes constitutional amendments, um, like the Ho-Chunk Nation that created a constitutional amendment recognizing uh, Earth law, rights of nature within their uh, constitution. We also saw that sometimes constitutional referenda for tribes, that can be, that can be really hefty. Um, and it may not be something that you want to take on tomorrow, or maybe you do, but it will take a little bit of time to get it through our legislative processes. So sometimes maybe you'll start with a tribal council resolution, a youth council resolution, maybe you'll work through an intertribal organization like National Congress of American Indians or any other type of, of intertribal org to get a resolution out there to start the conversation to say, you know, as a collective, we recognize the inherent rights of this of nature of or of a particular natural entity or species. Um, and that is about building processes through which we can respect nature and also fulfill our commitments to responsibility and relationality with our natural kin. And that may also come in the form of treaties. We've seen some really interesting opportunities where indigenous nations have worked together to form new treaties. Um, one example is the Northern Tribes Buffalo Treaty, which includes tribes um, on the US side of the imagined border and First Nations on the Canadian side of the imagined border coming together to protect Buffalo through, through a treaty agreement. We've also seen uh, fights in the courts, unfortunately. Um, we still live in a settler colonial society where uh, we are often challenged as indigenous nations, our sovereignty is challenged. And so sometimes um, we have some really savvy legal warriors um, and they put forward a really creative uh, amicus brief or, or addenda to court cases fighting for uh, the earth and for our different natural kin. And then hopefully it's also in these processes of, of advocacy and building out new legal mechanisms, we create rec replicable models where we can learn from each other as indigenous peoples and, and put these into practice. And so a few examples of that that I would love to highlight are declarations. So we've seen water declarations come, come forward. There's a, a great water declaration that was done by uh, Treaty 3 Grand Council of Anishinaabek uh, Nations and, and it's just a beautiful declaration for Nibe for water. Uh, we also saw an earth declaration, an Aki declaration done by Grassy Narrows First Nation who has seen um, so much degradation to their land and water um, as a result of, of the timber industry. And so I think there's again, so much that our indigenous peoples are already leading in and, and hopefully we can find ways to collectively support one another in these endeavors. And uh, some other cases, if we want to go international, there's some work happening right now in the context of the Snake River, um, working with uh, Nimupu folks to draft a resolution recognizing the rights of the Snake River. There are folks in Mexico and Oaxaca that are working to recognize different aspects of rights of nature and rights of rivers. Um, and also in Nigeria, uh, the River Ethiopia Trust Foundation, um, along with Earth Law Center, which is a wonderful international organization, also working with indigenous nations, um, launched an initiative to recognize the river Ethiop in Nigeria. And so I think the hope is that we will see this grow, right? We'll see this grow across scales from our, our indigenous nations to you know, our regional intertribal collaborations, cross treaty agreements to you know, our intergovernmental, government to government, nation to nation relationships with the United States and Canada to our international stage. Um, and Mini Kiwakan has been really instrumental at the international stage, and and hopefully we can we can continue to to advocate for the rights of of water and for uh, the spirit of water to be recognized at an international uh, level. Um, right now, there are different organizations working to promote rights of nature, um, rights of water within the Convention on Biological Diversity um, that's being uh, revised and going through a process of renewal and. It was, it was in there and then it got removed through recent negotiations as of July 14th, but uh, many folks are still advocating for language, rights of nature language to be returned into the revised uh, and renewed uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. And then we also have the IUCN, there's the UN Harmony with Nature Initiative, there's a potential for a UN Ocean Treaty and other types of international instruments. And in all these international instruments, we should be advocating for the rights of water as a living entity. Um, we should be advocating for the water to, to have a voice alongside us as humans. And so that's where we kind of ask this question at the end, you know, what if nature, what if water had a seat at the United Nations and, a and had its own delegation, just as many of the major member states do, 
to two major environmental treaties, a, a, a delegation of guardians that actually advocated for the best interest of the water rather than the best interest of their nation state. And that's what I wanted to leave you with. I know we've got some questions. I've got my email there as well as my Twitter handle again, but I'll turn it back over uh, to the team for where we're at with our live stream. Okay, thank you. We're just sitting here and just getting really amazed by all the information that you shared with us today. And I'm sure people are gonna be amazed by what they hear in this uh, presentation. So thank you for sharing all of that. I actually had a number of questions prepared and then you ended up answering the questions with each slide from the uh, past to the present and to the future innovations that we could be taking. And you spoke about the United Nations. I think I could add something on that. Uh, just recently, I believe the Indigenous Special Rapporteur uh, associated with Indigenous Forums at the United Nations in New York and Geneva, Switzerland, uh, had spoken about initiating an Indigenous water study. And so that's something that might be, uh, you know, uh, unprecedented on a global level uh, from what I know. And that's something that Maniki Wakan has also called for. Uh, on the global level as we attended uh, those indigenous forums to make recommendations. And so, you know, there's uh, one last thing too, you know, I think just uh, what you said about two thirds uh, loss of biodiversity in the world, um, that's really hard hitting stuff, especially the legalization of the destruction of nature and raising that water relationship to the level of kin, I think are key areas for our audience to pay attention to as well as everything else. And you presented a model on indigenous water justice that is pretty hard hitting. And I believe that provides a framework for a lot of people to uh, look at, to go from, and to really learn how to conceptualize, um, help conceptualize this area as we move further. So I guess uh, there's one last question I have is, uh, is there anything more that you think viewers uh, should know before, uh, you know, uh, we close this session out. Yeah, I would say, I think sometimes this information can be overwhelming, but just start somewhere. Um, you know, I had a, a great mentor in uh, Josephine Nandamanba, Anishinaabe, Quay, uh, Nokomis, um, the original water walker. She didn't like that title, but folks often call her that. Um, and she would always say, you know, the world can seem really dire and, and there's, you know, there's studies about climate grief and climate crisis grief and anxiety around climate change. And, and it's real. And, and, and Nokomis Josephine Ba would, would recognize that, but she said, you know, we can all do something. Um, so she said, yeah, yeah, that, you know, the water is hurting, the water is threatened. What are you gonna do about it? She always kind of charged each person that she met with asking them, what are they going to do? And so I, I try to carry on that message um, with everyone that I interact with in real time, virtual spaces to just say, sometimes we all can feel really overwhelmed. Our existing you know, climate anxiety is, is real, but we have to find a way to, to push through that and just do, do something, do something small even in your own pocket of the world that works to, you know, to help our planet. And ultimately those, those little things add up, but just so that you do something. Uh, not to have a Nike slogan there, but <laughs> it's important to, to do something. I guess I do, I do have a last question too, is, uh, you know, what, what things need to be done in order to realize that uh, future of indigenous water justice? You know, this question point for indigenous youth, uh, particularly who are working around these areas, you know, what things can we, in addition to what you provided, uh, do today, um, to achieve an unprecedented future of indigenous water justice? Well, one thing is I think indigenous youth are already, they're already leading. They're already doing really excellent work. When we think about all of the major um, protector movements that have emerged in the past 10 years, they often have been youth driven and youth led. So I think one of the things that needs to happen is we just need to listen to youth more. We need to amplify their voices. And I think youth can also do that for each other. So if there's a way for you to amplify another youth voice, to amplify an issue that's happening, a water issue, a water injustice that's happening in another community, do that. Um, when I say amplify, 
we have actually more access to technology than we've ever had before. And I think that that technology gives us the opportunity to, to amplify voices, to amplify our own voices, to amplify the voices of other communities that are maybe more marginalized than us or that we just want to connect with and share. And I think it's important to try and think of ways in which we can use technolo technology to restore those traditional kinship networks. You know, for thousands of years, we've had vast networks of, of tribal and intertribal interaction across indigenous peoples, even, you know, circumnavigating the world. And so I, I think being able to, to sort of imagine our, our indigenous futurism through that technology as being a tool for us to raise awareness, amplify our voices, and and be active in supporting youth-led initiatives and youth-led ideas and youth decision making is a critical uh, first step in really addressing a lot of the water injustices we see globally. Oh, Opala Kanka, and I think that closes our session for today. I want to thank everyone for attending and those who will watch. Again, you could go to uh, KelseyLender.com to uh, keep up with her and her work um, and just amazing information and knowledge. And so, you know, keep please keep up with her and also follow Maniki Wakan and everything uh, Kelsey does, Dr. Kelsey does as well. So with that, I'll close this session out. Thank you again, Kelsey, for attending and speaking and presenting here. So really grateful for your time. So uh, take care. Okay.